Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Wizard Factory podcast. This episode tonight is called Slain with Subtlety, dealing with cult indoctrination and trauma. And we are joined with a very special guest this evening. This is Thundra Staves Rangel. And Thundra is a former licensed massage therapist and energy healer of 17 years. She is now a spiritual counselor who helps empower her clients to discover their fullest potential through multiple tools, including Vedic astrology, ancestral lineage healing, and other resources that you can find on her website, thundrasr.com. Welcome, Thundra. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this. So are we. Very excited. We've got a really powerful episode tonight. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of very deep, you know, sometimes uncomfortable aspects, but these are very necessary uh, things to, to look into, especially when they're, they're all so common in, uh, in our society and very normalized, which is, you know, kind of pointing towards that concept within the the title of this talk slain with subtlety you know the normalization of it the subtlety of it is is such that you don't realize the damage that it's doing so um thundra uh if you'd like to open up here with uh with that quote that you shared with us Sure. It's a little bit long, but I feel like it really covers the mindset of a person who has been indoctrinated into the Jehovah's Witness. So um, this is from Valerie. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot that I didn't even kind of set the stage for your, your background regarding that as well. So you, you grew up Jehovah's Witness. Right. Yes, I was Jehovah's Witness from birth until right around the age of 20. Um, I was disfellowshipped, which is the term they use for basically kicking you out and shunning you. Um, that includes your friends and your family. And I, I was disfellowshipped for smoking cigarettes. And I got pulled into the back room and they wanted to figure out if I was repentant, and I wasn't. So I said, I'm not. And then my journey began, because at that point, my whole circle, my social circle, my whole life changed. So hey, who definitely. Says, who says cigarettes are bad for you? See, they saved you from <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Which is interesting, because that's Loki right there is smoke. So I feel like uh -huh. he's kind of been with me from the beginning, which I'm sure we'll get into. So yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I definitely think um, when you had uh, read this quote to us before, it was I think very profound, and I, I think it's a great um, way to set up what really the the foundational kind of mindset and effect that um, this specific cult uh, has on people. Um, so if you want to go ahead and delve into that, Thundra, um, I'm we're I'm ready sure. to delve in. Hmm. All right. So Valerie, what she had to say from her experience of being and as a Jehovah's Witness in her life, um, she said, the fear of persecution at Armageddon made me a scared, anxious, nervous child. The belief in demons gave me a nebulous fear of the unseen. My father was disfellowship, teaching me that people, even family, are disposable. Due to this, I didn't learn how to maintain relationships when things got difficult. I didn't learn how to negotiate during disagreements with loved ones. The belief that all of life's problems will be solved in the new system kept me from learning how to solve my own problems and how to work toward long-term goals. And it fostered a sense of contempt for the present world. As a school child, I couldn't salute the flag participate in holiday events or school elections. I was ridiculed and felt alienated from the other children. I wasn't allowed to join Girl Scouts where I might have learned self-esteem and how to work as a part of a team. The Jehovah's Witness rule to be no part of this world nor to be political meant I grew up without any sense of connection to my community, state, or country. 
There was a shame that exuded from the other witnesses and my parents and step parents that made me feel we had no value as humans and I was unimportant. Overall, I learned to be passive. Nothing was or is possible. I don't even decorate my house. I don't believe the future exists. I'm still surprised when I accomplish anything. I grew up isolated, ashamed, fearful, contemptuous, angry, and helpless. My ability to function as an adult in the real world was severely stunted. So I feel that she really was able to incorporate, like I had never personally seen um, really how the, the mindset of being a Jehovah's Witness and the amount of control they have in your life, it just, it encompasses every aspect of your personality and, and what you do and participate in. That things that other people take for granted are absolutely off limits because they want to control so much. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. definitely sets you up for a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually kind of bringing up a, um, a little thought here with me, you know, I was raised Christian as well, not Jehovah's Witness, but, you know, uh, Primitive Baptist and then Presbyterian later. And, you know, from my own experience, the doctrine is all about everything you do is to give glory to God, which in a non-indoctrinated kind of way, in a truly spiritual kind of way, that makes sense. But under the pretenses of what they tell you brings glory to God, you know, it's kind of like taking it back to that very like narcissistic mindset of just like everything is to bring, you know, bring glory to him. Uh, you, you're not your own person. You know, you don't have any identity. Nothing that you do means anything other than to be taken, you know, by him, that <clears throat> sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You have no in intrinsic value, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is something that, you know, Logan and I have uh, talked about before that, you know, which, in, you know, kind of the, the uh, Christianity in general, but, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, this concept of, of original sin or original self-imposed negativity, as I like to call it, because um, it, it is, it cultivates this, this mindset of a person that doesn't actually have a value for themselves. And just like she was talking about in the letter, you know, she, she came to understand that people were disposable or that they didn't really have any value and were disconnected and that you, you know, coming to a state of mind where you don't think anything else can change or nothing new is possible and staying in a state of, you know, stagnation and fear all the time. Uh, that, that's something that is, very deep rooted and, and it's very traumatizing for people to go through, especially when they're experiencing it as young children and then being raised uh, in a cult um, like this. And especially one that, you know, is this extreme. Um, so I'm sure that's something that you could probably uh, speak on more there, Thunder, if you'd like. Yeah, it's, it's so overwhelming to, to think about how, how much it really encompassed my life and, and so many people I know who, who grew up the same way and, and also left um, to, to see like that a lot of us have a very similar journey, um, which seems to be uh, when we get out, we just want to reject any form and all forms of spirituality. So there's a big push for like agnostic, agnostic and, and atheist uh, views, which, you know, I went down that road for a while and I just really found that it wasn't bringing me any sort of happiness. So um, I had to really figure out like, you know, who am I and what do I want in my life? And that's really an ongoing journey because when you are trying to recover from mind control and trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, these are things that you may be living with and you don't even have any idea because to you it's normal when you grow up in this kind of environment and then everyone you know is has a similar, you know, uh, experience. So you, it's, it kind of gives you a, a bit of a challenge to actually interact with people who don't have that background, which is why I think so many support groups have emerged um, around ex Jehovah's Witnesses or 
ex-Scientologists or Mormons. Um, because it, it feels like you, you kind of always feel like an outsider, which can be traumatic in itself, setting you up for um, issues with, you know, you know abandonment issues and things which obviously in your life and they won't even speak to you if they see you in a grocery store you're gonna have some abandonment issues so mm -hmm. the way that these things uh, continue to play out in your life is I think where the subtlety really comes in because you can live 20 years outside of a cult you can know it's a cult you can have deprogrammed yourself in that way but if you haven't really addressed the underlying emotional issues that are that go with this type of mindset, you're, it, it's going to manifest in your life, whether you're going to continue to repeat the same mistakes over and over, or you're going to have uh, issues with your health. I know many people who have come out of the cult, including myself, that we've been, you know, having to address autoimmune issues and things like that, it seems to be a really big epidemic from what I've seen. So, you know, really, you can do all you want, like with uh, changing your diet or taking supplements and, and things like that. But really, until you figure out like how traumatized you really are and, and address that and honor it and start working through it like on that emotional level it doesn't really seem like there it seems like it's more of an uphill battle rather than downhill so uh -huh. this is why it's something i really wanted to talk about because you know i personally i didn't even know what ptsd was i assumed it was something associated with uh veterans and people who had been through like a, a one traumatic experience in their life mm -hmm. and it turns out complex post-traumatic stress disorder is it, <laughs> there's so many things that can set you up to having this and you don't even realize um mm -hmm. And there's so many different responses as well. And if it's okay, I'd like to actually get into that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah. So there's actually um, in this book uh, by Pete Walker, it's called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving. This has been a really excellent resource for me personally. Um, a lot of light bulbs went off when I started reading this book because I felt like all of my life was kind of a mystery and that I didn't really know what was wrong with me, quote unquote, mm. wrong with me. It turns out that I was actually the only one in my family or friends circle of friends that was reacting appropriately to what I had gone through. So I had to take a look and say, you know what, this isn't because I'm wrong. This is because of what has happened and what I've been through. Um, so there's you know, actually four different uh, defenses. Go ahead, Logan. Uh, I, I was just thinking about the, the, the interesting kind of uh, dynamic there. As far as like, and I can relate to this, is sometimes when you're having a traumatic or even just a, st a generally stressful uh, situation in your life, sometimes that validation can actually be very healing. Now that can turn into a crutch later if you're stuck in that victim mentality and you just you're craving that validation like a drug but that that initial oh my god i'm not crazy somebody else has been through this and it you know and like relating to that to their experience and seeing like you're not alone you're not crazy like this you know other people have been through this too you know that can be such a relief to hear sometimes mm -hmm. I think that's a, right. a really good I know point. for me pers yeah, for me, my personal experience was like I never really found like a a group that I felt like I really fit into or a category, which you know none of us really do, but when you're searching and trying to figure out what your identity is, like you know I didn't know if I was an addict, I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I knew I had some aspects of different um you know, that I was exhibiting in my life that basically it all went back to trauma. It all goes back for me personally to the complex PTSD. And um, 
I think why it can be so such a mystery or why you, you, you don't really recognize it is because there's actually four different defense mechanisms that people will resort to whenever they have been under severe trauma. Um, two that we're all familiar with is the fight or flight mechanism. So you, you either go into a fight mechanism defense where you are taking on uh, aspects of your personality, become very aggressive and, and narcissistic and somewhat of a bully and, and honestly mm. can turn into like full blown, you know, sociopathy. Um, then there's the flight mechanism where you're, you know, constantly keeping yourself busy, where you're rushing around and, and, and becoming like almost OCD in your behaviors to try to fix everything so that you're not actually feeling what you're feeling. And then there's two other ones, which were really enlightening for me personally. There's a freeze mode and there's a fawn mode. So with the freeze mode is really whenever you start like dissociating, um, you isolate yourself and become like a hermit, which I know is part of the spiritual path, but it is also part of trauma. And you have to recognize that for what it is, if that is, you know, where your personal uh, introversion is rooted if it is rooted in trauma and then the fawn defense where you're very codependent you're trying to constantly take care of everyone else's problems you know and that sets you up for being a victim of domestic violence and what I really found interesting about those four different things is that you've got narcissism as the fight response on one end of the spectrum, and then you have the fawn response on the other side. But exactly. it's really all part of the same spectrum, it's right? Possibility. So yeah. just because you're exactly, and just because you're empathic does not mean that you're not, you don't have narcissistic. Uh, tendencies um, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Like, you know, we really need to start getting real about where does uh, your empathic abilities come from? Because I feel like this is right. something that's not talked about where people think it's some great gift and really it's a violation of boundaries on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the polarization can be very chaotic and, and, you know, kind of oscillate sort of wildly back and forth because I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's like, think if you're trying to balance on a beam and you have bad balance, you're kind of wobbly, like you're going back and forth. And really you just haven't, it's, I see the fight and flight is just yet another manifestation of masculine and feminine um, energies playing out. And so yes, the empathic, um, you know, aspect is like more, I don't know, it tends to be associated more with love energy because it's like, you know, they want to, be selfless and care and, and give and everything. But I mean, I think that having strong firm boundaries can be just as much of an act of love, if not for yourself or someone else who's being abused as well. Um, um, yeah, there, there was uh, quite a few things you said there that I, I definitely uh, thought uh, were interesting. Um, and that is that, that the fawn, I believe another way to it's referred to as tend and befriend. Um, you know, so when people can get into that state where they'll try to, you know, tend and befriend people because they, they feel like they're under some threat. Um, so then they try to appeal to that by showing that they're not a threat, they're a friend. Um, and I think that's a helpful way uh, to look at that. But um, one of the things that, you know, that, that letter hit on too, and that, you know, Thunder, you had talked about, talked about here is that mm. it, it's staying in the state of constant fear that you might not even realize you have so because it, it just seems so normal. So, you know, it seems normal to have tension in your body and things like that. But when we can look at the science of epigenetics and bring this in here, we can look at what stress actually does to the body. I think um, not only is that interesting to look at on the level of the individual but also when we can take that and look at it through, gen, uh, you know, intergenerational perspective. So when we can mm -hmm. see generations of people going through this kind of deep trauma to where it just being in this state of, of unhealth and discord is so normal that nobody's even aware that they're fucked up. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, the effect that actually can have on the genetics um, which you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I definitely. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. 
uh, you were you were talking about how you see um, a lot of health issues potentially in some of the community. So um, you know, I think there's some interesting connections maybe to be had there. Um, would you like to get into that some? For sure. Um, not only within your family history have, have I seen this. Um, are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah, you're coming through fine. I'm getting a little unstable connection here on my screen, so I just wanted to check in. Um, but yeah, this is definitely something like I benefited in, in, in being able to observe this, not only myself, but in contrast to other people because I'm adopted and yet I can see now that I'm aware of it that there's definitely two generations of very similar trauma and uh, how it's manifested in my grandparents, my parents and within myself and my sister, um, whether it was physically or emotionally. Um, and yet I see the same patterns exhibiting or, or manifesting in, in uh, people you know, who are raised with their biological family. So this isn't just about, you know, you've got bad genes. You know, my, this is something my mom likes to say, oh, you know, your, your father and I, we've got bad genes and we shouldn't drink and smoke and this and that. And you know what? Sometimes it, it's more than nature and it is nurture, which I think is something that people need to be aware of both. Yes, you can completely take on the uh, the trauma emotionally and physically of your family. Um, sometimes it'll it, it'll manifesting you first. That I don't know if you guys have really noticed this, but I see like in our generation, definitely seems like more people are are sick and getting you know into like serious autoimmune diseases and issues and things that you shouldn't really get until you you know quote unquote till you're old, till you're old. And yet I'm seeing parents, grandparents, and kids all developing illness at the same time, which made me step back and say, there's something more to this than just, you know, your genes or how you grew up. It's really, to, in my opinion, it's a combination of both and really boils down to what is your state of mind and, and what kind of state are you in emotionally most of the time, you know, because when it comes to PTSD, there's like this feedback loop where, you know, your, your muscles are, if your muscles are tensing up, you're actually sending signals to your brain unconsciously to say, you know, panic and stress mm -hmm, are, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in fight or flight mode and you don't even recognize it. And then your brain starts trying to figure out, okay, how do I fix this? What the hell's going on? And then, you know, you're in panic and, and all kinds of issues and you don't mm. even know why. It's just because you can't actually relax and you don't know it. It's that subtlety creeping in. Mm. And, um, and I, I, I wanted to kind of throw in this idea here that, you know, really from a spiritual perspective, in my opinion, it all comes down to sovereignty. Sovereignty is like the absolute, when it comes to the human experience and our relationship to the universe and through natural laws, sovereignty is the highest. And um, what we're talking about here is a fight or flight. And I, you know, I've been playing with this idea that fight or flight is a good uh, measurement device of a sovereignty violation. Because like, say, for example, even animals who don't have the ability to speak and say, no, I don't want this, they still have the ability to respond with fight or flight, which is clearly only in engaged when harm is imminent to them. So <clears throat> harm being the, the um, you know, determining factor of a, of a sovereignty violation, you know, I think it's important to kind of look at, you know, that, that subtle coercion that is creating these stress uh states that are normalized literally mm -hmm. very interesting and i think this is a, a great way to kind of like lead into actually looking at you know what are some of this you know uh cult you know let me say this cults in general will have some standard tactics and things that they use uh, to put people under my control, to indoctrinate them into whatever their specific 
uh, dogmatic doctrine or belief system is. Uh, so uh, specifically in context to like the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Thundra, would you like to delve into some of their uh, techniques uh, that they specifically employ? Um, and I know a big one that you had talked about um, when we talked before was uh, control and in every aspect of your life. And I think that's easy to just say, but um, would you like to kind of delve into that and break it down to really kind of show how extensive that control actually becomes? Sure. Um, the first thing that really comes to mind for me is that they really control your information. So, you know, we think of ourselves as being in the age of information here, right? And we've got access, you know, to the internet, you've got access to everything, but due to the programming that, that you go through, um, they really incorporate the state of, I mean, it's true fear, mm -hmm. you know, even down to what kind of television and movies you're watching, what kind of internet sites you're researching, your books, even education, like, you know, higher education is highly discouraged. They don't want people going to college. And, you know, like a personal example I can give to you about the, the fear that's instilled is uh, when, I, when I, I had been out for maybe the first two or three years, I started to, you know, I was asking myself questions and, and trying to figure out, you know, do I want to go back? Because they, you know, they want you to go back. They want you to live in this very masochistic state where, you know, they're, they're giving you tough love and, you know, it's all because you're going to return to Jehovah one day. So for me, I started saying, you know, is this really what I want? And let me do some research. And, you know, I started finding websites that were considered quote unquote apostate material, which meant anybody like me right now who's speaking out against what happened. I mean, this is like the worst sin you could possibly commit. I mean, worse than murder. You can't actually, according to them, be forgiven for this sin of speaking out against the, the group or the organization. And it's like you're directly speaking against God. So when I found at websites that were educational from ex Jehovah's Witnesses, I was like shaking. And most people will tell you the first times that they start really diving into information, they are literally terrified they're going to be possessed. Demons are going to come into your house. You know, I mean, just all kinds of crazy stories that they will tell you will happen to you. So that's a big thing is um, setting you up that way that you're not, they always say, you know, you live in the world, but you are to be no part of the world. So it completely sets you up as an outsider because you can't even necessarily, like we couldn't go to concerts. Um, just, you know, normal things. I wasn't allowed to watch PG-13 movies. And I was like 18 years old and living with my parents and I was scared to watch a PG-13 movie because, you know, they'll tell you, oh, if you, if you read the wrong book or watch the wrong show, you're gonna invite Satan into your home. You're giving him permission, so. You know, it sounds like really fucking silly when I think about it now, because I'm like, you can look at all the information you want. It's whether you actually put it into practice is really, you know, where you're, if you're going to invite something into your life, it's whether you're practicing that or not, not just having the information. But of course, you know, growing up like that, you don't realize that until maybe you've explored that a little bit outside their boundaries. Um, Another thing really big, obviously, is they control your social circle. So they don't want you having anything to do with anyone who is not a Jehovah's Witness um, because that can be bad association and all these people can have a you know, horrible influence on you and you can just become so lost, you know, just by having a friend at work or something like that. They control huge aspects of your time and energy because it really leaves very little time for you to explore any kind of hobbies or anything at all, honestly, because so much of the time is taken up with going to church four times a week, knocking on doors, personal study, and they're always telling you, you know, it's never enough. 
And, you know, if you have any kind of a problem, let's say, you know, somebody's got, you know, um, honestly, like a mental problem, you know, your, your uh, solution is always to go to the elders and they will help you. Well, these are just men who are leaders in the congregation. They don't really know how to deal with mental or emotional problems. So what are they going to tell you? Well, just pray more and work harder, you know, work harder for Jehovah. And of course you find yourself digging yourself into this hole where you're like, nothing's ever good enough. You don't have any other frame of reference from people from the outside. So you're just kind of stuck in this hell, quite honestly, it's hell for me. Mm -hmm. um, they, again, control of your uh, thoughts and the teachings that you expose yourself to as far as, you know, you can't read other literature from other churches or any sources that are going to be critical of them. Um, and I think this is a distinct difference between maybe a normal church and a cult is that, you know, in a normal church, maybe a couple, two or three people could get together and say, you know what, I read this scripture and I don't really understand it. What do you think? That's not going to happen as a Jehovah's Witness. You are absolutely told what to think about every single detail and any independent thought outside of that is considered, you know, treasonous. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's just what a, uh, what a disempowered state um, of existence that keeps you in. Um, uh -huh. Like you said, that any little problem, you, you, you're expected to just go and beseech the wisdom of these, these people, you know, these men that really have no honest credentials other than just probably some, you know, some kind of, you know, political social status that they achieved. And, um, and then they're just going to give you those disempowered solutions of just, it, it's, it, you know, when you said that, it kind of made me think like vote harder because it's like, do more of the thing that's not creating change and you'll get change. You know, that's the definition of insanity. Just keep doing what you've been doing. Just do it harder and, and, and things will change. You know, you're right. stuck uh, in that feedback. This loop. time I'll change. It's like an abusive husband or an abusive wife. Uh -huh. You know, oh, it'll, it'll be different this time. I'll just try mm. harder and he won't beat the shit out of me or something like that. So right. I'll just clean the house even more and cook even tastier meals. And yeah. Uh, what came up for me there is is really um, tying it back to the trivium process. The part of that mm -hmm. control, it, the c control of information, uh, what you're experiencing, everything, the control of that input, that's the first stage. It's the foundation of that process. So if they can control that part, e every, you know, every kind of decision, every thought you have is put through the filter of that control. Right. And then you can't act outside of it. So then they take, and then they tell you, you have to, you know, just go to the elders and then they give you something that, Oh, you know, it's not enough. You have to just, you know, keep doing this. Um, so they're telling you to take action, but not in a way that will actually change anything. It's taking action that will actually keep you stuck in that loop. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of what came up there for like me. a hamster in a wheel. Right. Just working, yeah. working, working, you know, never mm -hmm. going anywhere. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and then uh, what's, you know, so they control all the different areas of your life. What's another uh, important uh, technique that you think that they employ um, in this specific cult? Um, I think one of the things that gets downplayed a lot, which when you really think about it, should probably be the biggest red flag of all is the constant I mean, every single day fear of Armageddon, which basically means God's going to come and kill all the bad people, which are the non-Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> so like the entire planet's getting wiped out and you're going to be there to see it all and witness it all because they don't believe in a rapture or anything like that. So you're going to be, mm. you know, taken in by government and tortured possibly you know we were told stories of you know the jehovah's witnesses that were put in the concentration camps and the letters that people wrote in the camps you know this is stuff that they're indoctrinating little children with that they're going to be tortured and you know i 
can remember sitting in uh, elementary school. I had a crush on a boy, God forbid, a worldly boy who wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. And he sat in front of me, and I can remember looking at the back of his head and thinking, you know, like I started crying in my classroom. I was probably like eight or nine years old because I'm like, he's going to be killed. And I really like this boy, Aww. you know, and, and That's terrible. memories of, of begging my grandmother, you know, please become a Jehovah's Witness so that you won't be killed by God. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a constant fear that you have that you're going to lose everyone around you who isn't in the organization and even the ones who are because you never know if you're good enough or not to really that's make what it i through. was about to say so. is there has to be that little bit of fear in the back of your mind of oh what if god's not pleased enough with me what if i haven't done enough to earn my you know passage and i get wiped out with everyone else too mm -hmm. like that and there, yes. there's your constant state of fear like you're always in that you know cortisol Space. Right. And one, well, I think that's kind of exactly. interesting how they take, you know, what with the Abrahamic traditions in Christianity, where there's that, that fear of being punished for eternity and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. They then kind of take that and then move it more to the physical, the physical realm as, as well, to where, you know, oh, there's not even the rapture to where you're going to, you know, get out of all the suffering. You're going to have to witness it. And in fact, you're going to be tortured even more because of it. You know, I mean, so it's, um, it's just setting up, you know, for a cost of state of fear that you can't really get out of. And um, that's definitely, I mean, to just kind of look at Jehovah, even, you know, that just a, what a narcissistic um, kind of psychopathic. Uh, yeah. Deity. It's like, oh, or real swell, swell world you made there, God. Just a real dandy place, you know. <laughs> or, or just, you know, just that, that, that kind of just mindset to operate that, you know, people would need to worship you or, you know, like, or the entire, the rest of the world's going to be, you know, smited just because uh, he's displeased. Like, that, that's very uh, psychopathic. If we're honest, like, if uh, a human being said they were going to do some things like that, um, you know, we would, we'd look at that person like, all right, buddy, you know, you're, you're a threat. You need to, you've got some real fucking issues, but then, um, somehow, you know, if, uh, a God acts like this, then it's, uh, acceptable. Okay. And then something to be, uh, glorified and followed, um, you know, what an extreme form of gaslighting I think that is. Mm. Um, you know, and to say that, you know, this is a God that loves and things like that, but then yet to constantly be keeping and not just people, but like little children in that state of fear. Cause, and that's something that, you know, you were talking about wanting your grandma to do that. I, I remember some, as a kid, I, I was always really afraid of that because, you know, being raised in a Christian home, uh, my grandfather, you know, one of the wisest man I, you know, ever knew, uh, he always told me it was all bullshit and that, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of going to hell or anything, but because he wasn't a Christian, my mom was always really terrified of him going to hell. And then that scared me as a little kid. Um, you know, and that's really terrifying to not just think that you might be tortured or being worried about that for yourself, but being worried about that, you know, the other people that you love and care about might do that. Cause then, you know, it, it's, bringing in that ability for human beings to connect and have empathy for another, but it's like twisting it and using it to inflict trauma. So I think um, those are some things that came up for me uh, with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And when you were talking about the, um, the loving God and, and the whole, you know, the state of things that, you know, living and taking an extra layer where all the people who actually did what he said, are then going to be tortured before they even die and are take, taken to paradise or whatever. Um, and then, you know, most Christians I've ever spoken to will say things like, well, God didn't do that. Men did this, you know, um, human beings are, are wicked and vile. And so it's like, well, so we're all being punished for the actions of someone else, you know, or you're, forced to accept that your own actions are so bad that you deserve to be tortured or you look at the concept of original sin it's like well if human beings are that vile it's simply because god created them that way with original sin and then they say oh no they had free will in the garden of eden and then adam you know sinned and that changed things and it's like but that's a cyclical 
that it's, it's contradicting yourself. Either they had free will, and we all do. It's it's almost like he gave us free will, we fucked it up, and then he took it away from everyone, but then punished us as if we'd all done the wrong action when we no, now have no choice on whether to be good or evil because we're originally sinners, you know, inherently. Mm. Yeah, pre psychology. Right. And where's the sovereignty in that? It, well, exactly. exactly. It's anti sovereignty. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. Which, which I think is an, a fundamental essence of what it takes to become a member of a cult like this is that your sovereignty has to be stripped away because mm-hmm. you can't be that individual. You have to accept the mindset of the cult. Mm-hmm. If you're a sovereign being, then your, your mind will not last. They will, they will either disfellowship you like that or right. break one way or another. Right. You have to so. live in a constant state of denial, really, when you're in this kind of environment, which was not for me. I, I honestly don't know how people do this their entire life because I couldn't even take it for the first 20 years. I I was ready to get out, even though I still believed it. I was like, I just don't want this shit. This is too much. (laughs) Um, But I've, you know, I've never been shy about, you know, being myself. Um, The one thing that really came to mind too is like, I was talking about how they control like what you watch and, and, and information and things like that. And the, the absolute contradiction and hypocrisy when they're telling you, you shouldn't watch this R rated movie because it could have violence or you shouldn't play this video game or, or watch sexual content uh, online or whatever. And yet you're going to church and you're like a baby or a toddler and you're sitting there and listening to them read scripture about how once the paradise is here and all the people have been killed, it's going to be our job to uh, clean up the dead bodies and that the birds would come and peck out the, the eye sockets of the corpses. Mm-hmm. And yet they're telling you, Control your information and what you watch and what you do and what you read because you want to remain pure um, and in alignment with, you know, Jehovah's principles. But yet they're, you're getting a horror movie at church. And this is really where, in my personal experience, you know, when, when somebody brought up the, the possibility of PTSD or trauma, I was like, well, what trauma? You know, I really was in complete denial and I've seen this amongst, you know, ex-cult members in droves. They're like, well, what trauma? You know, well, yeah, this shit is not normal. It is not normal to be in a state of fear like that every day of your existence. That any, mm-hmm. any second, balls of fire are going to come out of the atmosphere and destroy everyone around you. And you're supposed to take joy in that. Like, that is really messed up. And that's yeah. something that I think people really need to recognize, like, that is not in any way, shape, or form normal or healthy. Absolutely. That's interesting, too. You're using the word normal, and it brought up something for me. There's, there's kind of like two different ways that you can interpret the word normal. One would be what is generally socially accepted by society, which is when, when we talk about these traumas that are normalized. They're not actually normal, but they're normalized because they're just generally accepted by people which is a form of moral relativism versus real normal is, is actually that which is in alignment with truth and natural law. Healthy. Healthy. Yes. Healthy. Exactly. And so it's funny how there's the perfect example of obfuscation of words and, you know, the, the light and dark connotations of everything and how you can, Mm -hmm. you know, either way. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, another point that you we, you know we had talked about was um, how in a cult it's all about putting the responsibility, your ability to respond outside of yourself. So you had mentioned the you know that you have you're supposed to just go to the elders or um, mm-hmm. you know all this or you know it, you're supposed to just allow God to take care of it or whatever it is. It but whatever. No, no matter what you're putting it on, it's that you're not putting it on yourself. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you're then telling yourself that you're right. not worthy enough and reinforcing trauma 
but then your the actions that you're taking by putting your responsibility out of there those are those are actions of self hatred so then you know that feeling of self hatred you know um, that sinfulness just keeps getting reinforced deeper and deeper to again where it becomes so normalized people just think that's how it's supposed to be um, until they they get to a point that they feel something that it like you know this is so wrong something has to go on and luckily you know some souls are brave enough to get to that point and question like you did thundra and start being able you know willing to take that path because you know leaving a cult is very very hard i know in, in my own experience you know um with the marine corps um which i won't delve into here but um you know it was a, something that was very very difficult to do um and something especially like this that you're raised in you know as an early child if it and with that kind of fear and trauma inflicted um you know definitely something that you have to be able to be a spiritual warrior to face um to to start to stand up you know because that that's i would definitely say that qualifies as being willing to die in battle because there's there's a whole lot of dying to the self that has to happen in order to come out of something that deep yeah and i think the big thing too whenever you don't take on responsibility for you know your actions as well as what's going on in the congregation is a really big problem and this is why like um there's a big thing now that's been coming out the last few years about sexual abuse is just being completely overlooked you know like how it was you know with the catholics is a huge problem within within the jehovah's witness community and when I think of this as an issue, you know, there, there's a, a line, you know, every, every cult has their propaganda words um, and catchphrases and things. And one of the big things we were always taught is wait on Jehovah. Just wait, wait, and Jehovah will take care of it. Rather than saying, hey, this is wrong. This is not okay for you guys to um, keep within the congregation someone who is sexually abusing kids and then like you know other people aren't notified because when you're disfellowshipped or you have any kind of a you know an issue um even if they don't disfellowship you it's considered between just you and the, the elders that you've spoken to so nobody else is aware of what's going on therefore everybody says you know just wait on jehovah and you know these were things that you know, in the, in many years past, I, you know, I tried to talk to my parents about this stuff very subtly <laughs> and they would, you know, immediately shut down and even bringing up severe issues like sexual abuse within the congregation being pushed under the rug and ignored, you know, well, Jehovah will take care of it. You know, we just have to wait and be faithful. And they're like, that is bullshit because if mm -hmm. something's wrong, it needs to be taken care of now, not 50 years in the future, you know, where, or even five years in the future, you're just waiting on this concept of your, you know, imaginary friend that's going to swoop down and, and cure every problem in the world. You're not taking any responsibility for your life. And that translates into all kinds of other issues where, you know, if you have a problem, you, you don't, you don't have critical thinking skills to try to, figure that on on your own because you're not taught that you have to really you know learn that and otherwise you're just constantly you know oh let me get this person's opinion let me ask this expert or, or authority figure which we all know is a you know bullshit term is a <laughs> authority is not really real it's just all a state of mind and we need to be our own authority and say you know what this is not okay for me or my children and and stand up and do the right thing Absolutely. Right. Well, truth is truth is the one and only actual authority, and that's why it comes. You know, the sovereignty it, it comes back to that is you have free will, but there is you know there's still the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. So you can choose between them, but ultimately the authority of truth itself is going to determine the consequences of that action. So that you know, I totally agree with you. Is like only. To your ability to respond to the injustice that is happening is what's going to fucking stop that from happening. Right. 
Right. And at least if you, you know what, if you choose the wrong thing, you you learn something from it. Mm. And that's a a lesson that I feel was really missed. You know, you never want to make a mistake or you don't want to make the wrong choice. Well, how the hell are you supposed to grow as an individual if you're just, you know, everything goes peachy your whole life and you just wait on God to fix whatever isn't, you know, good in your life or whatever. It really... That's exactly what's so, what is so anti-natural law about the Christian mindset is you've got this one lifetime to get it right, 100% right, because after that, your fate is set in stone. You're going to burn in hell for eternity if you weren't good enough for God, and you never get to learn your lesson after that. You never get to grow out of the mistakes that you made in your human, your singular one human life and come back and try again and do better nope that's it you know the end of the line it's it's you know it doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. it's crazy it really is it's complete insanity mm-hmm. i think um another thing that you had mentioned which i think is really profound is something kind of a phrase that's said within the cult there that um they'll tell people you know well what else would you do or you you don't have anything better than this um to where you know it's reinforcing that idea that, you know, there's nothing else they could potentially do that. This is, this is the only thing that could happen um, for them or they're the only possibility in life they could have. And that, you know, if they were to become disfellowshipped or they were to leave the cult, then, um, you know, everything will be over for them, you know, up to the point of obviously being, you know, um, you know, murdered by this wrathful God whenever, you know, or the government or, you know, whoever, um, whenever this apocalypse happens, um, would you kind of like to, you know, get into, you know, what, what that's like to kind of be told that all the time? Sure. Um, it's definitely, uh, for many of us, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's ingrained into the unconscious mind, the, the conscious and the unconscious mind, mm-hmm. to the point that, you know, you ask yourself, well, where else would I go? Which immediately sets you up a, in a disempowered state because you're looking to something or someone else outside of yourself as the expert, whether it's, you know, on your spiritual path or really anything at all. Um, you know, why, why are we so quick to think that other people are experts on our spirituality or what's best for our life? Like what, where else would I go? Uh, life, there's a whole world out there of things that you can accomplish and do and learn. But, you know, when you haven't grown up with, uh, those, uh, types of things being encouraged where you, you know, you're free to explore and use your imagination and create, uh, which is what we're all here to do. When that's taken from you, um, it, it's a very confusing and disempowered state to be in. So uh, it's, a, it's always good, you know, sometimes, you know, these things still run through my head on occasion. And I think, you know what, I'm the expert for my life. I don't need anybody else to tell me, not that we don't want to take input, but from trusted sources, because as we know, like, you know, when your unconscious mind goes on its own (laughs) and starts uh, being, you know, starts driving you into some crazy uh, situations, it's good to have, you know, someone there to give you an unbiased, you know, outsider point of view and perspective so that you can kind of figure out what the hell's going on. But, you know, for the most part, well, when you, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to remain an disempowered in life. When you can't even have an original thought without someone else just telling you what to think and feel and believe, you know, that's, that's a big problem. Don't even know where to begin. Yeah. And I, I really couldn't help but notice the glaring parallels between that narrative that you just described and the same thing that statists say when you try to tell them, hey, we don't have to have a, a ruling class. They're like, but, but what would we do if we didn't have that, you know, like, how would we survive without them? How would we get anything? You know, it's the same exact thing. And um, yet again, to 
you know, tie yet another parallel is kind of like what uh, the abusive husband would say to the battered wife, you know, that, that wants to leave and, you know, like go out on her own. He would say like, you'll never survive without me. You need me, you know, he, and then the narcissist wants his victim, his host to be disempowered uh, so that they need something from them and aren't able to go out on their own and break away because they're just as dependent. Mm -hmm. Right. It's complete slave mentality is really what it boils down to right. in, in all of the situations. Right. Just, That's you know, why I wanted when it to... comes to religion, it's on a bigger scale. But, you know... It is, but yeah, I mean, the, the dynamics are the exact same, and that's why I want I want to see these themes come up time and time again in these in these uh, podcast episodes because it's so important to understand that it, it's actually not that complex, like to um, to recognize the the systems that are being used to control to tr control us and keep us enslaved and keep us disempowered. Um, you know, it, it works the exact same on a mass scale, all the way down to the individual interpersonal level. The dynamics are the same. The psychology is the same. You know, it's the macrocosm and the microcosm. It's it's the law of correspondence. Um, and these same techniques have been used for thousands upon thousands of years. And until people learn them and how to, you know, kind of... Uh, defend themselves against them with that knowledge by being empowered by that knowledge they're going to continue to work on people mm -hmm. what this uh brought up for me too is that you know when you're keeping telling someone that you know what what else are you going to do by this and then you're keeping them in, stuck in the past and the future not, and you're robbing them of their vanity the present moment now um so their ability to it from the norse perspective to to weave their their web of weird to create their own reality and you're robbing them of their imagination, their I imagination, which, you know, you're taking their ability to create magic, to create a new life for themselves because you're controlling their information. You're keeping them in a state of fear to where they don't know how to act. They're never looking at the now and your magic can't work unless you're actually acting in the now you have to, you have to really start to take that action to, weave that reality that you want to experience um so i think that's really interesting in how they by keeping you either stuck in the past or stuck in the future and not present with uh, the power of imagination in the now um they keep you in that state of being disempowered you know um again getting back to that unholy trinity you know we've talked about before logan you know <laughs> right Ironically, I was just thinking too how even in the Christian religion, they're teaching you that while also betraying it in the imagery of Christ being the Christ consciousness. If we're actually looking at this allegorically, being you know crucified in uh, in the center between the two thieves, the past and the future, there's the three right there telling mm -hmm. you. Interesting. Um, Yes, and then um, one second. Let me get to get over here. Um, you're looking at the uh, like the sort of the ostracization of if you do become, uh, yes. you know, disillusioned and break away and try to, uh, you know, get outside of that, whether on your own voluntary accord or you're disfellowshipped. Uh, how the cult demonizes, you know the the heretics basically thundra would you like to you know kind of uh, elaborate on that a bit yeah it's uh <clears throat> it's something that you know i don't know if a lot of people can really relate to however you know if you just imagine you know everyone that you've known your whole life you know and it, they are elders in the congregation and people you've grown up with you know these men are like you know fathers to me and you know they go up on the on the stage at the church and they say you know so and so is is no longer a jehovah's witness and from that moment on you know to not even speak to that person really you don't even want to make eye contact it's like they have a plague and what that really does on a 
emotional level to someone is is honestly very hard for me personally to put into into words because you're just on your own after that you know um it's yeah. it's extremely extremely traumatizing and then what it sets you up for is like you, you know if you're if you're not just going to go and sit humbly at the church until they let you back in um you know if you if you do like i did and you go out into into the real world and you start exploring things you don't really realize there's a lot of consequences <laughs> to your actions necessarily because you let go of a lot of the you know the ideas or you just don't care you you know you for a long time i felt like well god's going to kill me anyway so i might as well have a good time and do whatever i can so <laughs> of course i set myself up for a lot of really bad karma it for reminds a me of long a, time that I, you know. I, no, just real quick. It reminds me of a meme that I saw that says, just remember, if you don't sin, uh, Jesus died for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's I definitely of, embodied that to the fullest that, <laughs> as much as I possibly could. That reminds me of a, a kind of Loki energy, you know, where like, you know, the mythos, a lot of times, you know, Loki will get himself into some predicaments because he's, you know, he's just like having, you know, kind of mischievous and, you know, he'll go have a good time, but then he'll end up getting himself into a situation. But through that, you know, having even more of an experience and, you know, transmuting it somehow. Um, so I think that's kind of, you know, interesting little thing that popped up for me. Yeah, um, it definitely, um, you don't you don't necessarily have any kind of like we were talking about any sort of like real identity or, you know, I don't want to say you don't have any self-respect, but you know, when you do think, well, God's going to kill me, I'm just going to have a good time while I can, you know, that opens you up to making a lot of bad choices. And granted, you know, I, I don't have regrets because I, I've learned from my bad mistakes, but had I been taught a sense of self-worth, and sovereignty, you know, growing up, I would have made completely different choices. And that's why I was saying, you know, it does become sometimes a self-fulfilling prophecy where your life just completely goes to crap. And yeah, it's because of decisions you've made. It doesn't matter that, you know, someone else are, convinced you not to care. There are, there are uh, unconscious manifestations of your own self-loathing because you haven't done the healing it's you know that's really profound if, to really think about is like it's amazing how much true self-love will just uh automatically correct your decision making process and and avoid self-destructive yeah. behaviors that are not conducive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah uh, and i think that's a problem with christianity in general not just the cult mindset um is that you're not taught um really you know like we we're saying that sovereignty and and then you're you know there's this idea that to be moral and, and to have you know this unwavering faith that you have to have a hard life and i don't believe that that's true i think it's true for a lot of people because they haven't been taught how to manifest what they want and and how to have that self-respect and sovereignty so they think being christian or being a good whatever makes you you know Mm. I'll have to have a, a life where you struggle. And I absolutely do not buy into that. I think that's BS. Right. And I think that's it's something we need to take a look at. And we still right. see this even with people who, who think that they've freed themselves from the Christian mindset, where if you want things for yourself, if you want like financial abundance or something like that, they project on you and say that you're greedy and that you just want to, you know, it's like, it's, it's <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm with you, Thunder. I absolutely reject that nonsense. I think that's the more vestiges of this puritanical mindset of, mm -hmm. of again, you're, they're taught, not, not only not taught self-love in this religion, they're taught self-loathing, that mm -hmm. you are a vile piece of shit, and the only thing that you can do to earn God's love is to completely de give your sovereignty away and devote your entire life to his glory, not you. If you want, you know, if you want glory, you know, that's satanic and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's totally backwards. Yeah. But Jehovah gets and don't out. forget. <laughs> yes. And don't forget that you're constantly being bombarded with this, 
phrase that Jehovah's people are the happiest people on earth. So you're being told all the time, you should be the happiest people on earth because you serve Jehovah. And when uh, you're not, you think, you know, again, you go into the self blame and you know, you like, it's more gas like, what's wrong with me? Why don't I fit into this? Yeah. It's just, it's like, it's like a oh, never ending this, cycle. Hey, oh, there's something wrong with you. I mean, it's the same thing as like the people, you know, the law of attraction, camp that you know it's like well in order to attract and manifest what i want i have to think and feel all positive thoughts and feelings all the time and if i don't there's something wrong with me and i'm not enlightened and i'm not spiritual and it it, it like just implodes in on itself mm -hmm. um yeah, and i think absolutely. uh talking about sovereignty here this this brought up for me too is that you had mentioned there's what's known as um if Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you refer to it as the governing body uh, in Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses, um, and uh, how that's essentially like a group of elders or a group of leaders that they're the ones that make you know the you know these decisions. And I you know I think maybe we could delve into the etymology of the, you know the word you know governing the control the controlling body. You know mm -hmm. is interesting, but how they can actually represent the physical manifestation of a spiritual sickness. And that is a separation and a disconnect from source. So because you're so lost from your own connection with source, there's actually been a physical manifestation that comes in as this governing body, this controlling a body, body, a physical yeah. manifestation. Yeah, body. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 You know, and then, you know, they actually, <laughs> you have to talk to them to be able to, you know, communicate with source or to, you know, that whole kind of mindset. Would you kind of want to delve into that? Yeah, I, I, I think what's interesting, it's a, you know, a little bit different. A lot of people don't know that Jehovah's Witnesses do consider themselves like Christians. So they do believe like, you know, in Jesus as a savior type of individual. But what I always thought was interesting was how they don't really... <sighs> You know, when I was growing up, the governing body were like these, you know, this idea. I didn't know what they looked like. I knew they, they were these men up in uh, Brooklyn, New York, that supposedly got, you know, uh, insight directly from Jehovah, you know. So they, they provide you your spiritual food at the proper time is how they mm -hmm. refer to it. You guys can hear the, the cult propaganda speak coming out. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it really takes away, like, you know, granted, I'm not promoting Christianity in any way, shape, or form, but for people who are Christians, um, you know, where they are still in that mentality where they do, you know, they're looking for a savior, um, it really takes away from that because you're really, you know, you're looking to men to help you figure out how to live your life and what's right and wrong, which, you know, I... It, it, right there, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at imperfect men. And this is where, you know, some of the double speak comes in where you say, hey, you know, you point out uh, a problem. This is a problem within the congregation. Well, you know, uh, we're imperfect men, so we can't be blamed is kind of mm -hmm. like how they'll respond. But right. yet they're setting themselves up to be your source of information for spiritual, for everything in your life. Yeah. So, oh, right. It's, it's, it's just, it's a, a lot of contradictions you have to try to yeah. work through. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, meanwhile, they, so they're, they're the mouthpiece for God and they ha they're privy to the communication that you're not, but you can still pray, but yet you can't trust your own commune communion with source or whatever through prayer and introspection and all that kind of stuff so it's like why why are we we the peons even allowed to pray at all if we still have to go and beseech the wisdom of the elders that somehow have the direct you know 1-800 hotline to jesus that doesn't make right. sense. <laughs> yeah you can't trust your own intuition in a uh -huh, situation exactly. like that gaslighting then, more gaslighting yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah um, one of the things I think, um, is interesting too, that you'd mentioned that, that I wasn't actually familiar with before is that, um, Jehovah's witnesses don't actually believe in a soul so much. Mm. Um, 
and how I think, you know, there's some ways we can get into uh, how that can play out with that unconscious feedback loop, uh, which I'd like to hit on. But um, uh, Thunder, would you real quick kind of like to introduce that or kind of their stance on that? Because like I said, that was something very uh, new to me that I, I hadn't come across right. before. Yeah, they don't believe that you have a soul that like leaves and you're, it leaves the body and goes to heaven or hell. Um, they believe you are a living soul. So everything about you is like is within the body. So okay. um, with that belief, like if I could just touch on this real quick is um, the inability to grieve properly when you know you're you're obsessed with death coming at any moment yet when people actually die you know there's you know you just think you know well they just don't exist anymore and wow. so i mean i don't know how, how that is for you know because i didn't grow up believing in, in heaven or hell but i know for me um when people died it, it was a very strange experience to uh, you know attend funerals at the jehovah's witness kingdom hall um I know a lot of people who were married for, you know, 30, 40 years, and then their spouse died, and they would be remarried within like a year. So there's not a real honoring of the grieving process, which is really essential to work through. And, you know, when it comes to any kind of, uh, you know, polytheistic or animist beliefs, you know, where, you know, we believe that everything has a consciousness on some level, um, you know, just to think of not existing at all is a very strange concept. Um, you know, and we were told, you know, that it's like the person is asleep and, and the essence of who they are is in Jehovah's memory. So you're waiting on, for instance, like, you know, when my grandmother died, you know, I had already deprogrammed myself, but had I still been a witness, you know, I would have been more, I, this is not really the right, I don't want to say the word excited, because you don't want to say you're excited about someone dying, but it, you're, you see it as an opportunity, if they're a non-believer, that they'll actually be able to be brought back to life in the resurrection. So they, it's almost like they get a chance, a second chance. And so that really warps your mind as a child, you know, um, I had recently had a conversation with a member of my family about my grandmother and she said, well, I'm, I'm just really happy that Jehovah will, you know, be, she'll be resurrected and we'll be able to see her again and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, you know, what in the world, you know, there's no real honoring of death and what it represents um, on any kind of level. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, they're just asleep and, you know, it, you, you might be able to see them again. So you might as well just keep waiting on Jehovah to make that happen. Right. And it's um, more of that weird zombie obsession that Christians seem to have with people coming back from the dead. And yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Dancing around. Uh, <laughs> but, like Game uh, of Thrones up in here. Yeah. The, uh, this hit up for me, you know, kind of looking at these techniques um, and how that plays out. It, what it's really coming up for me is this un, this unconscious feedback loop of dogmatism that, you know, uh, Logan and I have done a previous uh, talk about that. If people aren't familiar with that, uh, it's called chasing the tail of dogma. Um, and we talked about getting stuck in these unconscious feedback loops. And uh, as a short little intro in, into how that plays out, we were talking in the context of uh, the nine worlds in uh, Norse mythology and how those relate to us on a psychological level. And that starting in the realm of Helheim, which correlates with our unconscious mind, if we can put trauma there, that can actually open up a ghost door that leads to the realm of our belief systems in Asgard. And then that creates a feedback loop. And if you look at the different techniques, some of the things they do is, you know, they isolate you from other people. And, you know, Vanaheim is the realm of other people. So you get isolated from other people. Uh, if you don't have an opportunity to like, there, there's really with that perspective of no soul, there's no real opportunity for ancestor worship at all. So, you know, you're really cutting yourself off from the guidance of your ancestors. And then, you know, you're cutting yourself off from the realm of 
uh, unmanifested potential because they're always telling you, well, what else is there for you? That this is always going to be this way that, you know, just wait for Jehovah to do it. So there's no potential for new change. So when they're cutting you off from all these different important sources, what they do is they then lock you back into this feedback loop of trauma that just, you know, becomes this, this hamster wheel of pain that you get stuck in. Um, and then you become very dogmatic in that belief system. And then that, that trauma just keeps getting reinforced, you know, not only in your own life and more and more layers, but through, you know, throughout the generations, it becomes intergenerational trauma that is becoming enforced. And that's why that cycle and getting stuck out of, you know, out of that unconscious feedback loop um, is so important for an, an individual to do, but also extremely difficult to be able to step out of because you have to be able to face those fears, even if they're these, these huge fears that are in the unconscious and you, you've got to be willing to face that and die in battle to even start to be able to get yourself, you know, out, like, you know, even just seeking out other people that have alternative information that can help start empower you. So you can leave that. You've got to be willing to break that loop. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of what came up for me uh, when looking at all the different tactics and how this can kind of play in. For sure. If I could touch on that a little bit. Um, sure. I think an interesting concept when I first learned about that door, that ghost door that opens up between uh, Asgard and Helheim, I had a hard time really understanding what that meant until I realized, you know, like when we think of the gods and Asgard as being very childlike and innocent, you know, and that's really the mindset of a very uh, indoctrinated person is there's no room for thought or making uh, decisions, um, taking that responsibility and you're just, you know, you're kind of like a robot and you're very childlike in that way that there's no room for growth, but you're so hyper-focused on the rules and doing, you know, what you're told that there's there's no room for real like compassion and empathy and understanding. So like, you know, if something where, you know, somebody were to make a bad choice, you're just going to say, Oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that period, no matter what. And there's no room for real like compassion and saying, you know what, at this point in my life, I made a bad decision too, but I learned from it. And you know, the, the ability to empathize with people just is like stripped away from you. So what that does is it really does put you in that very evil mindset where you're just like completely, you know, these hard and fast rules and that's all that matters are the rules and, and the regulations. And therefore, when you don't have that empathy and compassion for others and, and uh, um, you know, uh, get getting that perception where you can look at things from different angles, it does, it sets you up to be a very evil person. I mean, think about it. If you're willing to shun your children for the rest of their life because they didn't follow the rules that you think are the best, like that's really one of the most evil things I can think of. Oh, absolutely. And, as, a, as a parent, I agree that with that. that <laughs> yeah. I can't think of anything that would make me shun my own child, oh, never. but I can understand the mentality because I've been there and I've mm -hmm. participated in that, which is why I'm so very passionate about, you know, teaching this and, and connecting with people and, ha and getting people to understand, you know, it's not always about what's, you know, Yes, there's, there's right and wrong. I absolutely believe that. But there has to be room for people to make bad choices and deal with the consequences. And, and for you to say, you know what, I'm not going to be a part of that, but I'm going to have compassion. I'm going to have empathy and I'm going to be here for you, you know, just as a decent human being would, let alone as, you know, a parent. It's almost like putting you, putting you in the mindset of an order follower. It's, it's like you're this cold calculating machine and you just have this program that you're running where like, these are what the laws are and these, you know, and I'm, you're just making these judgments about you're breaking the law. You know, there's no like connection. There's no humanity between and saying like, you know, Hey, I, I get where you're coming from. I see your struggle. You know? Yeah. Cause Go you're on. in an unconscious loop and cut off from other people, you know, like that's, <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, Ryan, 
why do you got to make sense and another thing that um when we had talked you had mentioned that you know in the cult there there's an extreme stress on um you actually using the term like uh, you know jehovah's witness or, or using the phrase in the name of jehovah uh, a lot and logan had brought up that um a lot of times you know um in the context of dealing with like a demonic force uh using its name or you know civil actually can then empower that force um mm. and there are certain other traditions uh you know like um judaism where they actually look at Jeho you know um that the abraham and god is actually like an imposter god or like a a narcissistic kind of demon that's there pretending to be god you know uh so if if we can kind of look at that and then you know I think it's interesting to see whether or not, you know, or, or to, to ask ourselves the question, you know, if, if, when you're using this, what are you actually empowering or what are you invoking? Um, you know, right. would, would yeah. you guys like to delve into that side of things? Yeah, it just kind of struck me as interesting that, you know, they chose to put Jehovah's name right in the title of the religion. Um, I mean, you know, I guess uh, Christianity does that too and, and that sort of thing. But I mean, you know, un, in the context of what you just explained, it just kind of uh, struck me as interesting, you know, because mm -hmm. it's like, um, again, it kind of has that narcissistic feel about um, it, it's all about me and you need to worship me and you need to call your religion after me and, and uh, all that kind of thing. And then uh, Thundra too, you mentioned something kind of, interesting uh about how isn't it considered kind of blasphemous to even use jehovah's name no actually i th think that's in uh I, I believe that the 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 jewish people did not pronounce the name because it's actually oh Yahweh, there's a lot of yeah. different mm. schools of thought but yeah the tetragrammaton which is the you know right. yahweh it's like the whole um, but that's theory. actually because I remember right. Too, that's one um, of the things that sets you apart is that you do use Jehovah's name. You're the only person who knows God's name, so therefore you're the only person, you know, as a Jehovah's Witness. You don't think other people's prayers are actually heard because they're not petitioning Jehovah <laughs> in their prayers, not using His name. I mean, can you imagine the projection and the amount yeah. of ego that goes into saying other people's prayers aren't heard by god yeah it's but, like uh, a little bit of narcissism there you know if they're worshiping yeah. a, a narcissist because that's you know um you know <laughs> you didn't use jehovah's name your yeah. argument is valid yeah if, if you're if you're <laughs> worshiping this this narcissistic deity that you know is is only you know wanting to do what it's wanting to do all the time and have everybody follow its, its exact will um, it's kind of funny that at, if that's what you're worshiping as, as a spiritual essence, that you end up kind of embodying those qualities yourself and then projecting them out there um, and falling into that narcissism uh, and that psychopathy, you know, yourself and how you interact with not only yourself, but the world and other people around you, both within and without of the cult. Yeah, I think the best explanation that I've heard Heard. I, I know that like there's certain religions uh, similar to like Santeria um, where they do uh, view Jehovah as an actual like demonic entity that they invoke. Um, but I feel the, the best way I've been able to connect with, you know, who Jehovah represents is the ego in itself. Because it, this, if you understand the lifestyle and then the amount of judgment and projection and stuff that goes on in in the congregation um it, it's just it's all ego it's all ego driven you, you know you're constantly comparing yourself or judging people I, I was the most judgmental like horrible person i mm. i like cringe when i think of like how i was as a, especially as a teenager um you know constantly judging everyone for everything and it's you know it boils down to ego not that having an ego isn't a yeah, healthy unhealthy. thing, but when you yeah. let that run the show. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like that's actually yeah. that's actually what I was just about to comment on here is when when you see an unhealthy ego, 
there's another one of those signs. You know how, like I mentioned earlier, the fight or flight response is a sign of trauma or stress. Mm -hmm. Um, An unhealthy or wounded ego is another example. And it's like when these things pop up, it's really important to kind of go like, um, why is this happening? You know, what is the coercion that's creating um, this, this uh, mentality? Because ultimately what a wounded, you know, your ego is your sense of self. So what this comes down to is your sense of self is distorted from the trauma uh, to where your boundaries are also distorted as a reflection. And that can mean they're either too small, like we were just talking also about the narcissist and the empath dynamic, where the empath has no boundaries. And therefore, they're just an open invitation to get trampled on and and absolutely no self-respect versus the narcissism whose boundaries are way out here because again it's it's about compensating it's either i've been so trampled in my sovereignty and my rights that i don't even exist anymore therefore i have no boundaries or i'm going to overcompensate for that hurt that happened to me by just like expanding my sense of self way out of proportion and there, you know, you were talking about that whole, the judgment and the, oh my God, like blah, blah, blah. The, the super inflated ego is just, a, it's, it's a boundaries issue. It's, it's the mm-hmm. lack of that thurizage energy and to bring it back to the runes. There's thurizage mm-hmm. right here. I love that I can point to my runes now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's why this, that's one of my favorite runes to work with right now. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what that brought up for me there, Logan, too, is that, you know, we had talked about kind of this um, unhealthy version of, of uh, Gabo, where mm. there's this trauma that, you know, it's kind of it, it's going both ways. It's not just one way or the other, because uh, in the call, you're not only are you taking in and being traumatized yourself, you're having your your boundaries violated by other people. But you're also, you know, even on an unconscious level, but even on a conscious level violating the boundaries of others mm-hmm. you know and it's this this wounded uh this trauma being passed passed back and forth that whole hurt people hurt people it's um, like the unholy you know. manifestation of the gabo the law of gabo dynamic right. exactly we were, we were talking about wounded. earlier the, yeah the the dominator not wanting the the subject or the slave to leave because there's actually a a you know, and, you know, I've talked about this too before where like you have, uh, so true Gabo, when the true normal, taking it back to yet another tie-in with the concept, true normal, in other words, in alignment with natural law, is um, a symbiotic relationship. The, the uh, narcissist and the empath is a parasitic relationship where, you know, um, there's still sort of a mutual give and take, but in it's, it's in a really toxic, unhealthy way, mm-hmm. but it's still, you know, it's still going back and forth. Yes. I think the interesting thing about a lot of this is that, you know, again, I'm going to go back to complex PTSD because all of these are manifestations of having uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, when people, you know, I, I have to say, you know, from my own experience, um, you know, I had to learn that isolating myself, which is something that I I definitely struggle with and have a tendency to do because I didn't know how to deal with my feelings in a natural way. And, And so my, when my feelings would come out, they would be very intense for other people to deal with. And what I started doing was isolating myself and, you know, not participating in relationships in a full and healthy way. And I thought, you know, my mindset with doing that was, well, I don't want other people, I don't want to infect other people with my negative energy, or, you know, I don't want to have to bring this into other people's lives. But it's actually an incredibly controlling and narcissistic way of being when you isolate yourself from people who love you or people who want to be in your life. And a lot of, I think that's something that, you know, I tend to, I have a lot of friends who are hermits like me. And, you know, I think that's one thing that I had to come to terms with and realize, you know, I'm not just some innocent 
you know, uh, empath who's been so trampled on in my life that I just have to stay in my house and everyone hates me and blah, blah, blah. No, like that was my way of controlling people. And I had no idea I was doing it. I just thought, you know, I'm, it's I'm trying like to a, keep them. Like a passive aggressive form of punishing, punishment. Yes. To give yourself That's that exactly of control. What it is. Mm. Very that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So, you know, like we've, you know, we had mentioned how the, the you know, the spectrum of narcissism and empathy are very similar. Um, and I think people, you know, who consider themselves as being spiritual simply because they have, uh, they have strong empathic nature, I think, you know, need to take a look at themselves. I know I really had to and say, yeah. you know, is this really a gift? If, am I trampling other people's boundaries? Am I being controlling and passive aggressive? And the answer was yes. And thankfully, you know, I had a, uh, a teacher I was working with who was able to help me with ritual and wor working with Sordisage and figuring out, you know, on a uh, down to the cellular level, like how that energy can manifest within yourself whenever you start setting good boundaries, which then, you know, ripples out into your outside world. So, you know, if you do have trouble finding your voice and setting those boundaries, just working with that rune in itself can just completely change your world. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thurisage is no joke. It can be a very intense <laughs> rune for a lot of people. And I found not, not only in my experience, but uh, with my, my students as well is that, you know, um that it, it's a room that if you if you want to work work with one um and uh see some a, a experience happen in your life and where you'll start noticing areas where you were either violating other people's boundaries unconsciously or you were allowing your boundaries to be violated unconsciously this room will will bring those things to your attention uh for sure mm -hmm. I agree. Um, it, it's such a great rune to start with, really, because almost everyone has some some level, some varying degree of distorted uh, boundaries. So getting yes. those more calibrated and corrected is so important. And not to mention your own boundaries with yourself as well as relating to others plays a part in almost everything you do, too. So starting there in such a, like, you know, uh, highly applicable area is really really beneficial you know yeah. it, it's just like casting the circle you know that for the same reason that casting right. the circle is part of our initiation package it's something to work into your daily practices you are invoking that process of your sense of self your boundaries um and that and that's good to be able to do um we had also uh wanted to hit on um well that, uh, yeah but Thunder was talking about, um, you know, some of the, the, the mindsets and everything and, you know, isolating and, you know, dealing with this, um, you know, you know, there's something wrong with you uh, or, or, you know, there's something wrong. Um, I think that a really useful idea um, that is, you know, applicable in many, many ways, other, you know, in, in other contexts as well, is that it's just to remember that it's not you, it's the programming that was, that was installed, you know, from, from birth. And in the title of this video, we use the word indoctrination. And it's just really interesting to me that they actually, you know, uh, speak of doctrine uh, within these religious circles, you know, very normally, like and not realizing the the correlation with doctrine and indoctrination. They're they're implanting these belief systems, these false axioms in your mind, like taking a perfectly healthy computer and putting a virus on it. You know, it's not the computer that's malfunctioning; it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. It's the programming that's the problem. And guess what? all you need is some Norton in your brain to clean that shit out and you can reboot and reformat and everything and, and um, get proper uh, programming that's actually serving your interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly. I, I think know, that's so important to remember. You're not lost. You're not lost to this forever. There's always mm -hmm. opportunity for healing. Um, and the truth shall set you free. And, and that's why the truth mm -hmm. is so utterly important because ultimately any, is, 
anything, any problem that we can encounter is some form of manifestation of a diversion or separation from truth. So if mm -hmm. that's the case, then only the truth can get you back to where, you know, healthy and normal, like we talked about, mm -hmm. in alignment with natural law. Yeah, and you had uh, you used a very useful metaphor earlier when we were kind of talking about this, uh, knowing that within the context of, you know, the whole kind of bull in a china shop metaphor. And if you think of that bull as like the mind virus of these mm. belief systems that we've accepted, you know, it can come in and totally wreak havoc uh, on your shop, on your mind. But, you know, you the process, it, it's not just going to be an instantaneous fix. Not only do you have to get this bull out, which is a big step, but you then got to clean up the mess that's left there afterwards. And all um, the bullshit he left behind too. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so you, can, you know, then really look at, and I think this is something that, you know, we, we talk about a lot is that recognizing that healing is a constant process. You know, you're always moving in trajectory towards something. It's not just this one state of being, Oh, I'm enlightened and everything's perfect and I'm happy and, and I'm good now. No, it, it's a state of always recognizing that there's a process and being able to respect and honor that process and understand that it takes work, it takes action, and you're going to have to take back your power in the now to be able to actually start to create what you want for yourself. Mm. Yeah, and this right. reminds it's me like of you commit yourself. Sorry, Logan. Oh, no worries. Um, this reminds me of a quote I heard that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard and it's so simple. Um, it's something to the effect of it's not your fault what happened to you as far as dealing with trauma, but it is your responsibility to heal from it. Mm -hmm. And so you can take this back to that mm -hmm. metaphor. It's your shop, the China shop. It, that's your home. That's your, your mind, whatever. Um, it's not your fault that someone put a bull in there, but you got it out. And now you're, it's your, it's your, your responsibility to clean up the mess afterwards. And so, you know, like, like what I was talking about before, where people think they've become disillusioned to uh, religion as far as like, they've renounced it officially on paper. Well, I don't identify that as that anymore yet they haven't really cleaned up the mess, all the broken glass in, in that's still just lying everywhere and still continuing to manifest and come out of their mouth in different various ways. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, it's, it's definitely an ongoing process and you know, it sucks that these things happen, but um, that doesn't change your own personal responsibility to do that inner work and get things back right the way they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be an easy process. Um, and it doesn't matter. Like in my experience, it didn't matter that I was out of the Jehovah's Witness uh, mindset for 20 years. When I started my personal work, like when I really, you know, I've been on the spiritual path for like probably about 13, 14 years now. But when I really started to learn about ritual and working with different planetary energies and the deities and things like that, which I, still, even up until like three years ago, scared the living crap out of me. I never in a million years would have imagined I'd be doing this, but I started manifesting some really scary stuff. I mean, I was, my unconscious mind, it didn't matter that, it had been 20 years, 22 years since I had been indoctrinated, that stuff was still in there. So when I started working, um, I think the first like real like sit down every day ritual I started working with was uh, Thunar. And, you know, I had some really crazy things coming up, which again, you know, goes back to thankfully, you know, I had a teacher. And that's why it is so important for people to have a teacher because it would have scared me to the point where I would have said, you know, I would have probably given up because uh -huh. I thought, you know, um, for instance, you know, I got run off the road. I, I almost got killed like a couple different uh -huh. times and, and all these, you know, otherworldly sort of events mm -hmm. started happening. And of course, my mind immediately went back to that Jehovah's Witness mindset of fear 
and mm -hmm. oh my god i stirred up some really bad crap with the demons and now they're out to get me i mean i even went back to that programming because i hadn't healed from it mm -hmm. and now you know like when i work with ritual and and things get you know you stir the pot a little bit and you know it's going to be challenging but at least you know what you're dealing with and right when you but it's when you don't like you know it doesn't matter how long <laughs> You've tampered in dark sided stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but it was something I had to be reminded of that this was my own resistance. This was, you know, that self fulfilling prophecy wanting to come out and keep me from healing. And, and I'm so incredibly grateful that, you know, I had somebody to help me work through those really traumatic times in the beginning when I really started working with with the occult rituals because mm -hmm. you know I like I said I had done it out of desperation it was like a last resort type of thing and you know it, it scared me and I thought oh no you know I, I should have listened I should have never done this but you know as I worked through it then things started changing dramatically for the better in my life and mm -hmm multiple food allergies and all kinds of things uh, that I had been dealing with with my health started to resolve. And so, yeah, it's, it's not going to be a linear process where you're just going from, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just going to get better and better and better. You, you're going to always feel like maybe you're taking a step forward and two steps back, but there's always a learning experience from that. And it, it's showing you what needs to be addressed as far as your unconscious mind needing that healing. So that's why I encourage people really to, you know, think about this process before you just like open it up because uh -huh. this is a lifelong commitment to yourself. Yeah. You know, people get married all the time and they make a commitment to the other person, but how often do we really think about I'm committing to myself to work mm -hmm. through this, this no matter what? Yeah. It's a really big deal. Yeah, I, I really like that. That's very well said. Um, cause that, that's very true. Cause when, when you start this process, um, it, it's very, it can be very intense. And especially if you're not like even fully like consciously aware, you don't have a teacher or a friend or a tribe that you can relate to of people that are familiar with this process. Um, it, it can be very difficult to go through on your own. Um, so I think that's definitely a useful tip that I, and I know in my own experience, um, you know, being able to have teachers as well that, you know, I pay to go, go to, to, um, learn from them and to be able to have them reflect back, uh, that, you know, in my, in my own process use very useful because for many, many years I was doing it a lot, um, you know, just mostly on my own. Um, and, it's possible, but learning everything through the apophatic method isn't necessarily always the most, you know, efficient in um, being able to do it in a, a short amount of time. Sometimes it takes many, many years of having to go through those uh, experiences that are difficult for us to actually figure out how to not make it so difficult on ourselves. Um, yeah, I've actually seen quite a few people who have sort of have the attitude like, you know, well, I don't need a teacher and I can do it on my own. And, and I, I was kind of taking like the long way around. I wanted to observe what was around me before I dove in and did stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some people dig themselves into some very interesting, almost uh, like narcissistic states of mind where they're in such a, a need for that identity that they've created a complete uh, reality around themselves that isn't necessarily rooted in re reality, <laughs> if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And right. they've kind of gone off the deep end a little bit uh, because they w didn't have the opportunity to sit down or, or they didn't want to sit down and say, you know, to a trusted advisor, what is your experience say about what I'm going through right now? And what do I need to learn from it? Yeah, you know, you have to be your own authority. But sometimes, you know, when you're dealing, I mean, I would say almost all the time when you're dealing with the unconscious mind, you know, that's like some real trickery up in there. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can go, you can go off the deep end. So you mm -hmm. have to be careful. You have to, I, for me, I, I always prefer to like 
observe and take things a little bit slower um, while keeping an open mind and always being open to um, other people's opinions, which you don't always want to hear, but sometimes that's the most helpful opinion is the one you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's great. So yeah, um, that's one of those oh, things where like, you know, I was actually just thinking about this today where, where somebody commented on one of my posts, I think something like, you know, um, don't care what anyone thinks or something. And, and like, you know, that's, that's the kind of rhetoric that I hear a lot and I, I get where they're coming from, but I think there's definitely a balance to be stricken um, here between stricken. That sounds kind of weird, but I think that's the right word. Struck. Struck stricken <laughs> between, between being open to hear an outside perspective right that you know other people have the ability to see things that you cannot from the outside looking in and there's a lot of value in heeding uh the trusted feedback and reflection from from a friend or even somebody who's not a friend they don't even have to be a friend to be right about what they're saying and what they're seeing uh versus letting that be so strong that it diminishes your own voice and your own sense of self to the point that you have all these confidence issues and these self-worth issues and you're constantly obsessing about what everyone else thinks of you there's definitely a balance in there. You know what I'm saying? I think mm -hmm. it's, it's extremely uh, kind of uh, almost narcissistic in a way to just say, I don't care what anyone thinks. I I'm just going to form my own opinions about myself. And, and that's the end of it. Because I mean, where's the room to grow when it, when it comes to that, especially if you're in like a, a more intimate relationship with someone, because mm -hmm. in my honest opinion, <laughs> Romance and all that kind of stuff is nice, but the ultimate goal is not to make you feel good or make you feel loved. It's to make you grow. And you're not going to grow unless somebody's being dead ass honest with you, even mm -hmm. about the uncomfortable stuff. And they're reflecting you on your own bullshit so that you can take an honest look at it. Mm -hmm. right. I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this is a good little kind of. Um, introduction into uh part one of this where you know we're kind of wanting to get into the general mindset look at some of the techniques what what are we foundationally looking at dealing with here and then we're going to come back for part two and delve into more of the solution side of things so yes there are these issues if you get indoctrinated into a cult if you know you've experienced these things you have you know some of this ptsd you know from society whatever religion that you brought up in but then we're, we want to look at, you know, what are the solutions, how we can actually go about doing that and, you know, looking at things like the arts and gnosis and some other things like that. Um, but Thundra, would you like to uh, let people know where they can find you and things like that? Sure. Um, I have my YouTube channel, which is under my name, Thundra Staves Rangel, which will be, I'm sure, linked at the bottom. My website is thundrasr.com. Um, I do a little bit of everything. Um, main focus right now is Vedic astrology, working with sound healing, spirit, animal energy, and, and I kind of do a little bit of everything. But if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can find me through YouTube or on my website, thundrasr.com. Wonderful. Well, um, yeah, thank you again for, you know, joining us for this and, you know, very excited to delve into part two of this into the solution side of things. But um, I think we got on, got into a lot of good stuff here um, and um, very glad to be getting this information out there because um, especially, you know, it seems like with this specific cult too that, you know, not unless you're specifically have had an, an experience with it, you don't actually you're not even aware to maybe what extreme some of these behaviors uh, go on in certain groups. Uh, so being able to bring some of that to light so people can recognize what, what may actually be going on behind the curtain, so to speak, um, is a very useful thing to do. So I'm, I'm glad to have been able to bring you on to, to, do, to do that. For sure. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, there's a lot of people that kind of in the new agey movement that they don't want to talk about, you know, the negative quote unquote negative things. And, and this is really how I mostly feel like, you know, 
addressing that is really where the healing starts is being honest about your journey and what you've been through. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here guys. It means a lot Absolutely. to me. Yeah. Thank I you agree. for coming on. You have to recognize where you are before you can expect to figure out where you're going. So it's like, you don't want to stay in that victim mentality of, you know, this, this happened to me or my trauma or whatever it is. But if you don't first acknowledge that you're, you're never going to get uh, past it. You know, mm -hmm. you have to call it, right. you have to call it what it is. Can't right. let it go. If you don't even know what's there. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. Well, this sums up this, uh, this week's episode and part one for this and, you know, be, be sure to tune in for the next episode. Uh, and as always, remember to be empowered, inspired, and encouraged.